Hello and welcome to the first track tenancy webinar with Vancouver Island Regional Library. My name is Dahlia and I am a branch librarian in Kwamichin, what's known as Duncan on Vancouver Island at the Cowichan Library. Kwamichin is home to BC's largest First Nation, the Cowichan or Cowichan tribes. I would like to also acknowledge the Stumina, Slayaxon, Malahat, Tubatsit, Halalt, and Penelicate peoples. For centuries, these nations walked gently on the unceded lands where I now live and work. Feral service area runs from Haida Gwaii in the north to Sydney, North Saanich in the south. It includes the Coast Salish, Haida, Haltsuk, Kwakwakiwak, New Chanaf, and New Hawk people that have been the stewards of the land within our service area since time immemorial. Thank you all for joining us this evening and I will let Emma from TRAC introduce herself and take the webinar from here. Thank you, good evening. Uh, thank you for being here. We appreciate your presence tonight. Thank you, Dahlia, for promoting this webinar and we are glad to join you today uh, from um, the we are located in unceded Coast Salish territory, including the lands belonging to the Muskiam, Squamish, and Slaywood nations. This is where we live. This is where we dream. This is where we play. This is where we work, and we are grateful for that opportunity. So today we're going to be speaking about residential tenancy law. I will inform you that I'm going to stop my video so that you can concentrate on the presentation. And with that. I'm going to start sharing my screen. So here we go. So tonight we're going to be speaking about residential tenancy law in British Columbia. And um, you're going to learn about what TRAC does. We are a nonprofit. Um, and our mission is to promote and enhance the legal protection of residential tenants across BC by providing different services. Among those, information, education, research, and advocacy on rental housing matters. We have already acknowledged the land we are sitting on and we are grateful to be working on these lands. Okay, so a track we offer different services. Among the services we offer, we offer a tenant information line uh, and please be reminded that track is not part of the government. We are a nonprofit center and we staff the information line for the whole province. Um, it, the information line is staffed with only two persons. So as you may imagine, we are very busy, but we are glad to answer your questions. Uh, and then you may be on hold for a long period of time, but believe me, it is gonna be worth it. Um, then we also offer the full representation program uh, that pertains to two advocates in, in Vancouver. Um, our legal advocates always help you with evictions, with representing you for unfairness, and there is an intake process. You have to be low income, and you have to go through our intake paralegal coordinator, Ana de Pablos, and she's the one who does intakes and then uh, follows through with you if you want to come to us. Uh, remember, we are based in Vancouver, and unfortunately, we are a very small center. There's only 10 of us, and we do a lot of stuff as a nonprofit. We also offer workshops and webinars, uh, but I forgot to mention that on the full representation program is for the residential tenancy branch hearings. And we also have another service offered by the Housing Law Clinic. The Housing Law Clinic is staffed by two lawyers at TRAC, and they do judicial reviews. They also provide advice, and they also provide roommate advice, which is a, the, the last trend here in BC, um, because there's no housing. So uh, for the workshops and webinars, that will be my program. I do in-person presentations in the Vancouver area, the Lower Mainland. And sometimes we travel. If people offer um, to book us, then they offer us to stay at a specific place. And then we pay for our uh, fare to go to you. 
Uh, today we are doing a webinar. It's uh, something that the library has put. And so we are thankful that you have invited us today. So the workshops and webinars may be, you know, hosted by the libraries or the person who is inviting us, or it can be hosted by track as well. And then so um, we carry plain language publications on our website. It's a very good website, as you can see from here uh, on the screenshot. Uh, we have different resources that you can access on the website. We also carry template letters that can help you resolve your issue. You just have to visit us and go under resources. A menu will drop. Please click on template letters for you to be able to access them. Uh, we have a uh, presence in social media lately that has been a little bit forgotten because we don't have a person who answer questions or um, updates uh, the social media. We also have the online course, Renting It Right, which is good. It has three parts, finding housing, which most of you are experts on, and uh, your rights and responsibilities, as well as dispute resolution. Uh, it's an online course, it's free, and you get a certificate at the end. We also do systemic advocacy through the information line. We identify trends and problems that tenants are experiencing, and we pass that and we pass that on to the executive director for them to do further uh, research on problems. <clears throat> we teach you the basics of residential tenancy law. Um, it's about tenants and landlords' rights and responsibilities under Residential Tenancy Act, Residential Tenancy Regulation, Manufactured Home Park Tenancy Act, and the regulations, as well as other documents, such as policy guidelines and rules of procedure. Uh, tenancy law in BC only pertains to BC. So if you come from a different province, say Alberta, or if you're coming from Ontario and you think that the rules from your province will apply here, I'm telling you, they don't. As tenancy laws in BC are different than tenancy laws within Canada and other parts of the world. Um, the residential tenancy law in BC also teach you about, uh, they also teach you about tenancy agreements that cannot avoid or contract out of the Residential Tenancy Act. And what that means is that tenancy agreements cannot include unconscionable terms that are oppressive or grossly unfair. I'll give you an example. When your landlord tells you that you are not allowed to have guests, that would be an unconscionable term as you are allowed to have guests under reasonable circumstances. The Residential Tenancy Law also teaches you about uh, jurisdiction, which is coverage under Residential Tenancy Law Act, as not everyone who rents their home is a tenant under Residential Tenancy Law. This is expressed in this uh, slide. You are not a tenant under Residential Tenancy Law if you share a kitchen or bathroom with the owner of the property. So say, for example, uh, there's you are an owner and then you want to offer housing for someone then you say okay I'm gonna rent rooms perfect but if you share a kitchen or a bathroom with the owner or with the main renter you are not covered under the act you would be considered an occupant or a roommate so if you are a renter you need consent from your landlord to do that then if you rent from another tenant with whom you live as their occupant and roommate there is no protection and so then there are some other instances under Section 4 of the Act for more in-depth information. If you live in cooperative housing, not covered. Student housing provided by your school, not covered. Vacation or travel accommodation, hotels or Airbnbs, not covered. Emergency shelter or transitional housing, not covered. Housing-based health facility that provides hospitality support services and personal health care is not covered. Living accommodation made available in the course of providing rehabilitative or thera therapeutic treatment of services. All of these are not covered under residential tenancy law. Um, if, for example, you are a renter or you think you are a renter and you are renting from another tenant, uh, you are not covered under the Act and your legal recourse will be found under the Civil Resolution Tribunal that handles non-residential tenancy disputes. 
So who is the Residential Tenancy Branch? The Residential Tenancy Branch, also known as the RTB or the RTO, as in Residential Tenancy Office, is the Department of Provincial Government in charge of Residential Tenancy Law. They offer telephone assistance, they have an excellent website, and they offer official forms, and they are also in charge of the dispute resolution process when there is a hearing on the phone with an arbitrator. So uh, there is only one office in BC located in the city of Burnaby. And uh, if you want to put documents through, you can do it through the Service BC centers and uh, that act as extensions of the RTV. They intake documents, uh, fax documents. They can also send them to the RTV for them to process your application. But normally, the residential tenancy branch prefers for tenants to apply online to apply for the dispute resolution process. And so that brings us to the dispute resolution process. What is that? Well, uh, the dispute resolution process, it's a hearing that happens on the phone. It's similar to court, but almost always done over the phone. If you have a specific disability and you want the hearing to be face-to-face, -face, you may request that at the residential tenancy branch. Not normally, the, it is done over the phone, and uh, um, an arbitrator is the person who makes a decision for both the landlord and the tenant. It's similar to a judge, but that is the person who makes a legally binding decision. Um, it is not free to apply for a dispute. You must pay $100. And you may be repaid it if you are a low-income applicant, and uh, the fee can also be waived um, entirely. But if you are a low-income person and you checked off in the application that you want to get that money back, you may get it back as long as you win the hearing. And so the arbitrator will grant you the money back, and the landlord will have to pay you back or vice versa. Uh, when you use the dispute resolution process, you have to... Uh, bring evidence as allegations don't count. And so you have to have evidence like hard copies, photographs, receipts, witnesses, letters, anything between you and the landlord. So uh, text messages may be considered evidence as well as emails. But at the end of the day, it is the power of the arbitrator to accept them or not. Uh, the dispute resolution proceedings can be unpredictable for a few reasons. One, arbitrators are not bound by previous dispute resolution hearing decisions. Two, arbitrators make decisions based on a balance of probabilities. And three, hearings usually only last up to one hour. And so uh, you have to refer to the residential tenancy branch rules on procedures uh, for dispute resolution for more info. Then we quickly move to uh, tenancy agreements. What are tenancy agreements? So tenancy agreements are legal contracts between a tenant and a landlord. Uh, landlords should give copies to the tenant uh, within 21 days. And believe it or not, verbal tenancies are still covered under the RTA. But we strongly recommend tenants to have a written agreement so that you can refer to your contract whenever there are difficulties with your landlord. You can always refer to the contract and base your answers on that. Plus, the rules are included in the contract on the template from the government that can be obtained from the residential tenancy website. If you go under forms, then you can print a form there. Uh, I will be taking questions at the end, uh, but if you have any questions, you can enter them on the chat and I will take a look at it at the end. Now, tenancy agreements also include uh, the type of tenancy you may be under. It's called beginning and term of the agreement, as you can see here. Uh, there may be month to month or fixed term tenancies. Most tenants begin on a contract and convert into month to month after that. Uh, so a tenancy agreement should also include the key landlord contact information, uh, such as the legal name, phone number, address for service, and email addresses. 
a landlord must have must give the tenant a copy within 21 days. It is important to have the landlord's correct legal name and address as both are required in order to apply for dispute resolution through the RTB. So if a tenant, for example, needs to apply for dispute but does not have their landlord's contact information, you can look um, up on our webpage, looking up my landlord, to find out what you need to do to get your landlord's information. But normally, the landlord must provide this information to us renters. And so then uh, I'd like you to pay attention to this part where it says beginning and term of the agreement, and I need you to concentrate on letter E. Letter E is normally used by a landlord. At the end of the time, the tenancy is sended, and the tenant must vacate the rental unit. That is only permitted in specific circumstances. So for example, if a landlord checks off letter E, sorry, letter E here, right? Then they have to state a specific reason under section 13.1. Though the only two reasons are the tenant is on a sublet and must vacate at the end, or the landlord clearly included here that they were going to occupy the unit. So uh, that's vague clauses are only allowed in limited circumstances. So please pay attention to that. Initial it, if your landlord uses this letter, they have to follow the rules, okay? And so then a contract will always include the type of rent that you will be paying and whatever is included in the contract will be checked off in these little boxes. Landlords can also include additional information. As, as an example, um, you have parking for two vehicles or you can park your vehicle in the garage, et cetera, right? So it's always important uh, to pay attention to the contract. A contract will also tell us uh, how much you are paying of a security deposit, if you are allowed to have pets or not. So it's always important to have this information handy as you never know when a dispute can race. So landlords have an obligation to give a signed copy within 21 days to the renters. Now, what can my landlord ask me for when I am a renter? You can find your answers in this document at www.oipc.bc.ca slash guidance slash, I mean, um, hyphen documents slash 2332. You'll find your answers there. So we have, we have questions such as, can my landlord place a camera in the building? Um, they need mutual consent from the tenants and the landlords to be able to put one. Can my landlord ask for my SIN number? The answer is sometimes they can and sometimes they cannot. The sometimes is normally for a valid reason. If they want to do, for example, a SIN number just to find out who you are, they have to do like a credit check. And so then it's key for them to it's key for them to uh, let you know what is going on. So uh, a tenant, for example, wants to know, a landlord, for example, wants to know about your credit history. Can they do a credit history check? Yes, they can, but they still need your consent. And so this is a document that is very useful and you find a lot of information. Now, one question we get from the island is, um, can my landlord do a criminal check? The answer is uh, sometimes they can, and the sometimes is a very misleading word. So I would say, yes, they can, if they have a valid reason to get that done. And so questions like these, you will find in this um, link, and then you can read the document that you see here is really useful. There are about 35, um, questions answered there regarding privacy. Now, what type of tenant are you? So we have ruled out that occupants and roommates are not covered under residential tenancy law, and that only leaves us with co-tenants and tenants in common. Now, co-tenants are people on the same tenancy agreement and are jointly, legally, and severely responsible for the contract. I'll give you an example. Two friends from university start renting an apartment, a two-bedroom apartment. Both names are in the contract. Then, after a couple of months, 
they decide that they don't get along and one of them wants to move out. Can they do that? You have to be careful because you are co-tenants and you are severely and, and jointly responsible for the tenancy. What that means is the person that gives notice to move out would have the effect to terminate the tenancy for the other. And unless the landlord consents for you to stay put with the same contract, it can be done. Otherwise, the moment one of the co-tenants gives notice to move out, that would have the effect to terminate the tenancy for both. So you have to be careful. You you want you might want to choose the person you really want to live with as co-tenants, as if you don't get along and one of you gives notice that has the effect to terminate the tenancy for the other. Now, the other type of tenancy that exists in BC is called tenants in common. This will be better if you have, as you will be individually responsible and you will have a different tenancy agreement for the other person. So the same two friends from university, they try to uh, sign into a contract, but they ask for individual agreements. That would be better. That is gonna protect you somehow because uh, the person who wants to uh, move out can give notice and that has no effect for the other person because they have their own individual tenancy agreement. So it's really critical when it comes down to co-tenants. So it is best to know before you sign up. Deposits and fees. So this is money tenants paid at the beginning of the tenancy. It is known that most tenants in BC pay half a month rent for a security deposit. That normally seals the deal. So what this means is that the security deposit will be paid in good faith. Landlord and tenant are entering into the tenancy agreement. But if the tenant wants to change his or her mind about not moving in, then Section 7 takes over. The person who doesn't comply with the tenancy agreement must compensate the other for damage or loss that results. What that means is that I signed the contract, I paid a security deposit, but I don't want to move in any longer. So now the landlord can ask me to keep my security deposit and pay for one month of rent. That's a penalty. Under section seven, we must compensate the other for damage or loss that results. So you may not have even signed documents, but only paid the security deposit, the landlord can still claim the security deposit and one month of rent. So you have to be careful with this. A pet damage deposit is only paid if pets are allowed, if the landlord gave you permission to have a pet. In most cases, landlords don't like pets and therefore you don't have to pay a pet damage deposit. But if a landlord consents on you having a pet, you must do an inspection on the day you bring your pet and you must pay the pet damage deposit, which is the equivalent of half a month rent. Now, uh, landlords don't have an automatic right to keep our security deposit. What this means is that a landlord cannot include in a tenancy agreement that at the end of the tenancy, they will keep our security deposit. Tenants must give consent. It's in writing and it is on the inspection form. So doing an inspection is really key for both. Now, uh, there are deposit interest rates at 1 1.5, 1.95%. So there is an interest calculator that can be uh, used for you to find out how to calculate your interest. Since 2009 up to 2022, it has been at 0.0%. 0 .0%. But for 2023, the interest rate is at 195%. It's some money. And so um, when you move out, if you move out this year, then you will be making a little bit of, you know, some sense there, here and there. It's not bad, but I mean, something is something. So your interest will be calculated through the interest calculator at the residential tenancy branch calculator. So you can go there or you can call us a track and we can calculate it for you. You would have to remember though what date you started your tenancy for us to be able to calculate it for you properly. Now, application fees are illegal. What that means is that a landlord is not allowed to charge a fee 
for allowing someone to apply for a rental unit. Say you're filling out an application and they say, oh, you have to pay us, that would be illegal. Or say, for example, the landlord wants to know your suitability as a tenant, do a credit check, they cannot charge you. Or accepting you as a tenant, they cannot charge you. So you have to refer to Section 15 for more information at the Residential Tenancy Act, okay? A tenant is allowed to have guests also, including overnight guests under reasonable circumstances, which is the next thing. Uh, no guest fees, even for overnight visitors. Landlord cannot restrict guests for accessing a tenant's rental unit under reasonable circumstances. So uh, non-refundable fees is related to monies, um, tenants and landlords agree. So for example, a landlord will give you a number of keys, but if you lose that key, you, the tenant must pay for it, not the landlord. Um, if you live in a strata or a condo, move in and move out fees will be charged uh, by a strata corporation to the landlord and the landlord can claim these fees from the tenant. It's legal, it's not something that tenants will not agree on, they will agree because that is how it is set off by the strata or the condominium association. Now, a landlord may include in the tenancy agreement that if you are late with the payment of rent, they can charge up to $25 for late payment of rent, no more than that, okay? That's the law. If you find that the landlord has written $75, then you can challenge that on the regulations, section seven. And so if a landlord includes that they will charge a late fee for the return of a tenant's check by a financial institution, uh, the landlord may include that the bank is charging them 75, then the tenant is on the hook for that payment, okay? So, but those term, terms need to be included in the tenancy agreement. It's not as easy as, oh, just because I say so. It must be in the contract. Even, for example, if you add an additional occupant and if the contract clearly says that you would be charged an amount for adding a person, it will be legal if it is in the contract. Those are non-refundable fees and they should be clearly explained in the contract. Inspections is something that tenants don't understand there are consequences for if you don't participate. Tenants and landlords should complete a move-in and a move-out inspection report together on the day they take over or on the day they move out or another mutually agreed day. So it is mandatory for tenants to participate in the move-in and the move-out. If the tenants don't participate, they are extinguishing the right to claim their money back. So please know this and follow the rules. There are consequences for both if the inspection is not completed. So just follow the rules, participate, as tenants and landlords should complete both move-in and move-out inspection reports. However, it is mostly the landlord's responsibility to offer tenants the opportunity to complete these inspections and provide copies of the reports. According to the RTA, if a landlord fails to do that, to do that uh, the right to claim against a security deposit is extinguished. And this goes both ways. If the tenant doesn't participate, the tenant is waiving his right to claim on the deposit. So don't do that, please. We quickly move on to the rights of tenants. This is a very common scenario on the right of quiet enjoyment. Tenants are supposed to be free from unreasonable disturbances. Examples of unreasonable disturbances can be smoke, noise, intimidation, and harassment. And under the umbrella of quiet enjoyment, uh, tenants are supposed to be free from illegal landlord entry. A landlord must give a minimum 24-hour notice, but not more than 30 days. And in that written notice, it should include the date, the time, and the reason for entry. Landlords have a big window to come in between 8 a.m. until 9 p.m., but normally they decide to do it within 9 to 5 or working hours. 
And if they come in late, they should give us a minimum 24 hour notice. So some landlords would like to come in between seven to 9 p.m. They can do that as the law allows it, but no farther than 9 p.m. They should have a reasonable explanation to come in. Normally the reason can be that they are doing maintenance or that they are doing an inspection at the request of the tenant. Uh, the only exception when a landlord is not gonna give us a notice to come in is in an emergency because um, it is necessary to protect life or the property. Examples of emergencies are flood, fire, and water leaks, just to give you the most common examples of uh, emergencies. Landlords will just let themselves in with their spare key. As you already know that, right? Landlords have a spare key to come in into our unit. They are allowed to do that under legislation. Let's quickly move on on the repairs. Tenants have the right to ask for repairs, so don't be afraid to ask for that. Uh, landlords are generally responsible to uh, do maintenance and uh, uh, things they are responsible for are heating, plumbing, electricity, walls, floors, ceilings, locks, keys, access devices, and intercoms, light fixtures in common areas, fire doors and fire escape and smoke detectors, elevators, painting at reasonable intervals, cleaning the outside of windows at reasonable intervals, routine ER maintenance such as cutting grass and clearing snow in multi-unit complexes, tree cutting and pruning, insect and pest infestations such as bedbugs, rats, mice, bedbugs, uh, serious mold issues, and anything else that has been included as part of the tenancy agreement, such as the appliance, appliances. So landlords are generally responsible for making repairs to the tenant's rental unit to ensure compliance with the health, housing, and safety standards required by law. There are also some other uh, legislations by cities or municipalities or districts that landlords need to comply with. So it is always good to call the district, the municipality or the city to find out what further protections there are for tenants as well as obligations for landlords. Normally, landlords need to comply with policy guideline number one plus section 32 of the Residential Tenancy Act, as well as municipal standards of maintenance by laws if the city have them. Now, what is then the tenant's responsibilities? Tenants must maintain reasonable health, cleanliness, and sanitary standards throughout the unit. If you, your pets, or your guests damage something, you, the renter, are responsible for that damage, not the landlord. And that doesn't include reasonable wear and tear. So normally people ask, what is natural wear and tear? It refers to the natural deterioration that occurs due to aging and other natural forces where the tenant has used the premises in reasonable fashion. So what this means is that you, the renter, are responsible for any damage caused by you, your guests, or your pets. You are on the hook for any damage caused by this definition of guests, your doing, and your pets. So for example, cats like to scratch carpets. So if your cat destroys the carpet, you are on the hook for that. So in other words, you have to pay to fix it. And uh, uh, do not withhold rent if landlord is not maintaining your unit. We normally hear on the information line people telling us, my landlord doesn't do any repairs, so I'm not going to pay the rent. First mistake, you never stop paying rent because you will be hit with a 10-day notice for non-payment of rent. You might not want to do this in this housing crisis in the province. So never withhold rent. Instead, 
apply for dispute resolution. So an arbitrator can give a um, reason or an order of compliance with the act or an order of repairs. What is the tenant's responsibilities when it comes down to repairs? Well, the tenant's responsibility is to notify the landlord when something needs to be repaired, and then you need to do it in writing. Please do not text message them. Please do not do emails unless that is the only way to reach out to the landlord. Instead, use our template letters so that you can definitely document properly and mention the portion of the law that accompanies that. And if you delay and the problem gets worse, you could be held responsible. So your main responsibility is to notify the landlord in writing immediately. Now, there are emergencies that the landlord need to act upon immediately. Emergency repairs are urgent and necessary for the health or safety of people or the property itself. Examples of emergencies are major leaks in pipes or roof, damage or block water or sewer pipes or plumbing fixtures, primary heating system, damage or defective locks and electrical system. So what can a tenant do in an emergency? Well, the process is, if a landlord's emergency contact cannot be reached after two tries and a reasonable amount of time has passed, the tenant can pay for the repairs and get money back from landlord, but be reasonable and keep the receipts. Or apply for dispute resolution to ask for an emergency repair order. But you always need the consent of the landlord to do that. So say, for example, your fridge went. And so now you want a new fridge, you need permission from the landlord to get a new fridge, or you have to wait for him to resolve. You never do this halfway. So your landlord is responsible for things such as the elevators, the heat, the, the plumbing, uh, infestations, and floods. Also, your landlord is responsible for defective locks. So it is in the best of your interest to communicate your concerns to the landlord in writing. Landlords can offer essential and non-essential services. Essential services are, um, term, are services that are indispensable or fundamental to the tenant's use of the rental unit. Example of essential services are heat, hot water, and elevators in multi-story apartments. As for non-essential services, cable, internet, and parking and storage may be considered non-essential services. And your landlord can, uh, can, is allowed to terminate or restrict non-essential services as long as they provide 30 days written notice in the approved form and reduce the rent by an equivalent amount. In other words, they should be coming to you and say, hey, we're going to restrict the parking. We are removing that service. And so it was a non-essential service, fair enough. But now, Mr. Landor, because you are restricting that service, you now need to pay me a reduced rent by the equivalent amount of the service that you are reducing. Rent increases happen in different manners. The standard is when landlords can raise the rent every 12 months, must give the tenant a three month written notice on the approved form and must comply with the amount set by the government. Unfortunately, many landlords are threatening tenants and saying, you pay more rent because I have a mortgage and the cost of life is high or I will evict you with a two-month notice for landlord's use of property. It's really sad, but it is happening. Okay, but uh, tenants can write a letter to the landlord and explain that they are only able to pay the standard amount, which for the year 2023 was at 2.0%, but that changed this month. And now uh, the standard rent increase will be at 3 0.5 percent 
So many of us are getting the rental increase this month for next year. The three month notice will be at 3.5%. There are some exceptions and those are for nonprofit housing where rents are related to income. And so rent increases are related to a re yearly review and the rental increase will be based on the income you make. Tenants who live in BC housing or nonprofit housing subsidized by BC housing will be only paying 30% uh, of their income towards the rent. And there are some other ways to increase the rent, such as a terminal agreement, allowing for increased rent for additional occupants, if there is a residential tenancy branch order, and the landlord can also ask to pay more for capital expenditures, uh, for um, landlord's expenses as well. So there are about five types of rental increases, also additional rent increases agreed with the landlord. Landlord still has to give you the three month notice if you agree on an additional rent increase. So say the landlord came to you and said, listen, I, I'm having problems with my mortgage, so I need you to pay a little bit more rent than the standard amount allowed under legislation. And if you agree to pay more, say for example, $100 more or $150 more, then the landlord still has to give you the three, the three month return notice in the approved form on that additional rent increase. Giving documents to the landlord is something that tenants and landlords must understand. The tenant gives notice to the landlords and the landlord gives notice to the tenant. Rule the term, rules determine when a document is legally considered received by another party. If you give the document in person, it is received on the same day. If you fax it, attach it to the door or email it, to an address provided for email service, it will be received three days after. Or leave it in the mailbox or the mail slot, it will be re received three days after. So um, you might wanna say that if you mail it via regular or registered mail, it will be received on the fifth day. So these rules apply unless there is a rebuttable presumption. So a rebuttable presumption means that even though the residential tenancy branch has rules about when a document is considered received, they may not apply if there is evidence of the documents being received on a different date. So for example, if you mail a notice to your landlord and get mail email confirmation that they received it three days later, an argument could be made that it was received after three days rather than five days. So this is a little bit scary, especially for email uh, service. All tenants and landlords must sign document 51 um, to accept email service. So you can do it via email. It's not the automatic right of landlords nor tenants to send an email and be accepted. You actually need to have signed 51 for the service to be accepted, okay? And so when you receive a document, you may want to consider it received the same day to be safe. Text and social media is another issue that tenants and landlords face. For form notices that need to be served in writing in accordance with the RTA, hard copy documents should be used, believe it or not. And so a landlord should not send an eviction notice using social media and a tenant should not text notice to move out. So please mind these rules. For general correspondence, text and social media messaging may be okay if it can be proved that the other person received it. So for example, text messages to and from your landlord about repairs may be considered valid evidence at dispute. Then we move out quickly to moving out. 
on month-to-month -month tenancies, as you can see here. If a tenant wants to move out on September the 30th, they need to give notice two weeks prior to the termination of August. You always give notice before the payment of rent and you still move out on the 30th. But if you forgot to give notice in August and give notice on the 1st of September and you still move out on the 30th, you would be responsible for October's rent because the one month is on the month you move out. And you must give notice a one full month written notice and give notice at the end of the previous month that you are moving out. Leave extra days to ensure the notice is received on time and tenancies end at 1 p.m. on the last day. Therefore, serving documents is really important here. So if you're moving out on September the 30th, you must give notice prior to the 1st. That's your full month notice right there. If you are in a contract, as a tenant, you don't have an automatic right to terminate your tenancy. You need consent from the landlord. And there should be six or more months left in the contract for you to be able to break the contract. Again, you need consent. You may have to pay money for the landlord if they included liquidated damages, which is the cost of re-renting and advertising the place. If your landlord wants money for lost rental income, they have a duty to mitigate. It means that they must show the unit, they must advertise at a reasonable rent, and they must accept a reasonable tenant. And this is the job of the landlord if they included liquidated damages. There are other ways to terminate the tenancy and that can be a mutual agreement, but you are not to sign a mutual agreement if the landlord wants to evict. Never sign a mutual agreement as you are under no obligation to sign a mutual agreement, especially if it is about terminating the tenancy because the landlord wants to move in. Do not sign it and call us. There are other choices such as assignment and sublet. There needs to be six or more months left in the contract. You can claim a breach of a material term if the landlord is not maintaining the unit or maintaining the appliances. If there is family violence or there is a long-term care situation, then you can terminate the tenancy earlier if there is a third party very fire. So you have to follow these rules. Call us if we have questions. We will be able to answer them. Remember that I said that landlords don't have an automatic right to get our deposits at the end of the tenancy? And this is true because one, you must do an inspection. Two, you must give a forwarding address in writing within one year. But you will forget. So on the day you move out, make sure to provide a forwarding address in writing. Landlord has 15 days to return the money to the tenant or get the tenant's written permission to keep some of all the deposit or apply to the residential tenancy branch for permission to keep some of all the deposit. If a landlord doesn't do any of these three things, the tenant can apply to the RTB for double. We have seen some victories from tenants who have applied for that. So now we will talk about evictions, which is when the landlord can give a tenant a valid eviction notice for a, for a valid reason. And that is when they want the tenant to move out. There are four types of eviction. Number one, Attending notice for non-payment of rent and utilities. This notice can be received if the tenant is only one day late or a few dollars short. If you are late paying rent and receive a 10-day notice, you have five days to resolve, to pay up in order to cancel the eviction or to file for dispute resolution to resolve it. 
Again, this can be under the name of 10-day notice for non-payment of rent and utilities. Number two, one with notice for cause for different reasons. Common reasons are the tenant is repeatedly paying the rent late. Three times is considered late. Landlords don't have to give you any warnings. They can just hit you with a one month notice for cause. Um, violating another tenant's right to quiet enjoyment, damage something and do not help repair it, a sign of let or add an occupant or a roommate without the landlord's permissions are reasons for the one month notice. Very common. Fail to comply with the material term and ignore the landlord's written warning. Engage in illegal activity that negatively affects the building, landlords, and other occupants. Receive a government order telling you to move out. This is the case of illegal suites. It's a very common scenario. Illegal suites are still covered under Residential Tenancy Act. If an illegal suite is discovered by your city, it may be shut down. And if your city orders you to move out, your landlord is required to give you a one month notice, but no compensation. So some tenants may live in illegal or unregistered suites, and these may be secondary suites that have not been registered with local governments, do not comply with zoning regulations, and are otherwise in violation of municipal bylaws. So importantly enough, tenants living in these suites are still covered under the Act and can enforce their rights through the RTB. But if a city does find out about a tenant's illegal suite and wishes to shut it down, they have the power to do so under residential tenancy law. And in these cases, the landlord is required to give the tenant a one month notice under residential tenancy law. And although the actual move out deadline could be shorter, depending on the situation, the landlord does not have the right or the landlord does not have to compensate the tenant for their moving cost. But if you want to make a case at the, VR, at the RTB for that, You'll have to prove that the landlord needed to compensate you because they make you homeless. Number three, two month notice for landlord's use of property because the landlord's close family member wants to move in. And close family is a very specific definition. Landlord's spouse, parents, or children of the landlord or the landlord's spouse. That will be close family members. Number four, four month notice for landlord's use of property because the landlord wants to demolish, convert the unit into non-residential use, convert the property to strata lots or cooperative housing, convert the rental unit for use by a caretaker manager or superintendent of the residential property. And so this form of notice can be used for repairs and renovations. If that is the case, then for renovations and repairs, your landlord may try to evict you if they want to make major renovations or repairs that requires the unit to be empty for an extended period of time. If that is the case, then the landlord first must have permits in place approved by the city. Two. The rentals and repairs require the rental unit to be vacant or empty. Three, the rentals or repairs are necessary to prolong or sustain the use of the unit, and the only reasonable way to do it is through vacancy. However, landlords are not allowed to serve you an eviction notice. Instead, they must apply for a dispute resolution hearing where an arbitrator needs to be convinced that the unit needs this and will be given permission for a four-month notice. So it's a really good thing. Now, 
For the form of notice for landlord's use of property, uh, there are some questions you may consider. How extensive are the rentals? How long will the unit be vacant? How much of the unit will be affected? As common law allows a tenant to accommodate some rentals to avoid eviction and continue their tenancy. For the two and the four month notices for landlord's use of property, if a tenant receives a two month notice, they get compensated the second month. And for the four month notice, they get compensated on the four month. Now, if you are a tenant who is on a periodic tenancy, that means you are a month to month renter, right? Then you are allowed to give a 10 days written notice and move out early. But if you are in a contract and your contract is ending in the next two months, you cannot use the 10 day notice. And landlords can possibly get in trouble if they give you the two month notice and don't follow through with the reason. The tenant could be in for 12 months of rent, and this is good for both the two and the four month notice. The burden of proof is on the landlord. If the landlord didn't follow through, then the tenant should not jump the gun. The tenant should wait for at least five months to apply for the 12 months of rent as compensation. Please tenants call us. If you are a landlord, do not call us. You need to call the RTB. Our service at track is only for renters. Tenants who live in buildings have the right of first refusal. In residential properties containing five or more rental units, the tenant being evicted due to rentals or repairs have a right to first refusal, but the tenant must put it in. The landlord is not going to ask you to do it. It is the tenant who would have to put in the right of first refusal. Tenant must provide the RTB form exercising the right of first refusal, and the landlord has an obligation to provide a 40 days notice before the completion of the rentals and repairs. The landlords must inform the tenant on the date the renovated unit will be available and provide them with a new tenancy agreement and no limit on the new rent is very discouraging. But the good thing and positive thing I see is that if the tenant puts in the right of first refusal, they will be able to exercise that right if the landlord did not give you the 40 day notice. Problem is, there will be no limit on the rent. And if the landlord doesn't follow those rights, uh, of the first refusal rules, they could end up paying the tenant 12 month rent compensation. You will get a two month notice for landlord use of property, but a landlord cannot issue an eviction notice simply because they have put a property for sale. They actually need to have sold the property and all of the conditions for sale have been satisfied and the purchaser or the close family member plans to move in in good faith. But again, just putting up the property for sale doesn't allow the tenant to kick us out. And sometimes a landlord will uh, say, for example, that when the unit has been sold, the new owner doesn't want to move in, so the contract transfers to the new owner. In other words, you don't have to sign a new tenancy agreement. It transfers. Landlords are not allowed to increase your rent. And when you get an eviction notice of some sort, if you get a 10 day notice and you feel that you don't deserve to be evicted, you have the chance to dispute the notice. 
When you get a 10-day notice, you have five days to dispute at the residential tenancy branch through the dispute resolution process. One month notice, you have 10 days. Two month notice, you have 15 days. And if you get a four month notice, you have 30 days to dispute. That is your right as a tenant. And the eviction process wraps up. If a tenant would be removed by a landlord, the landlord cannot just kick you out with an eviction. There is a process. And this process is if a landlord wants to physically and legally evict a tenant, then the landlord should give the tenant an order of possession that is approved by the RTB. And the tenant would have only two days to get out of the unit. Tenant is still overholding. Okay, so now the landlord is allowed to go to Supreme Court and hire the services of a court-approved bailiff, not any random service. The BC Supreme Court writ of possession will give him permission to hire the services of a bailiff. And there are other recourses such as um, after challenging and enforcing a residential tenancy branch, there are reviews, but the tenants must comply with one of the three reasons you see here, circumstances between beyond individual's control, new and relevant evidence, or fraud. You just have to meet one. So when they do the review, then um, they may stay the decision. It means they will not change the decision. And if that happens, the tenant has the right to go through a judicial review through the Supreme Court. Uh, there are fees involved. It's $200 to file. And there are services that can do that review. And that will be for track our service through the housing law clinic and the community legal assistance society and track also does monetary enforcement a small claims court you'll have to do an intake if you want to come to us and you have to come to us with a hearing date either for a monetary order or a dispute resolution hearing you must come to us with a hearing date. Don't come empty-handed, in other words. Tenants' responsibilities um, are to pay rent in full and on time, keep the unit clean, and notify the landlord for any repairs immediately. Tenants are responsible for any damage caused beyond normal wear and tear, and don't unreasonably disturb others. Don't do anything illegal and dangerous. You follow these rules, you'll be fine. It's a two-way street from the landlord and the tenants. Landlords are running a business and they should provide a copy of the tenancy agreement and provide two opportunities to complete move-in and move-out inspection reports. Provide a receipt for rent paid in cash and return deposits on time. Make repairs. Uh, to ensure the rental unit complies with the health, safety, and housing standards required by law, and provide quiet enjoyment for tenants. These are the key landlord's responsibilities. Any final thoughts? If you want to tell your landlord to stop breaking the law, you need to ask them in writing. On our website, we have template letters that you can use to address your problem. Always remember to think about gathering evidence such as photographs, witnesses, and receipts. And if you are unsure about something, call us. Talk it over with us. We can give you some ideas on how to deal or handle your situation on our information line. 
Our info line is open on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays from 1 to 5. And on Wednesdays, tomorrow, we are open late from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. But you might, you might like to visit our Facebook page if by any chance we cancel the line for a specific reason. This is our contact information. That is our website at tenants.pc.ca for further answers that you might like to check. And we also have, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, the Rent and Net Right course that you can do on your own time, at your own pace. You get a certificate at the end and you can do the three parts of the course. The first part is about finding housing. The second part, it's about your rights and obligation. And the third part, it's about dispute resolution. This is our number for you to reach out. 604-255-0546 if you are within the Lower Mainland or 1-800-665-1185. And we have presence in social media. Our Facebook page, I mentioned, you can reach out our Twitter account, and our Instagram. Feedback? You can do surveymonkey.com slash r slash set l x q p y p or you can visit our website and then you can give us your feedback for a tenant's workshop. And this is me and over to you. Dahlia, for questions, I'm going to check here uh, for questions. Yeah, so um, if, if you have any questions, you can put them into the chat and we will do our best to answer them this evening for you. Thank you. And uh, I'm ready for your questions. So let's um, try to answer questions now. Yeah. Put them in the chat and... They cannot um, open their mics, right, Dahlia? No, no, uh, it's, it's all muted. So um, uh, just the chat function works for the webinars. Perfect. So Linda's wondering if the Tennessee branch still has a booklet. Um, mm, it beats me. Uh, they used to have one, uh, but I don't think they do any longer. Yeah. At track, we had the tenant survival guide. And so I'm going to stop sharing to take you uh, to, um, to take you there. And we have something called um, tenant survival guide. Okay, so... I'm going to start sharing again, but I wanted to show you our wiki book. So to answer your question, I'm going to start sharing again. And uh, this is our wiki book. I sent this to Dahlia. So she will send some resources and you can access the wiki book here. Wonderful. Are there any more questions? Are there any other questions? Um, I have a few questions from patrons. I unfortunately have to help uh, almost daily with um, dealing with different housing situations. Go ahead, please. Uh, so the first one is around um, tenant, sorry, landlord use. So um, let's say somebody receives a um, uh, notice to move out, um, they comply with the notice to move out and um, they suspect that um, it's not actually being used used for landlord use. How do they go about proving this? It's a little bit challenging yeah. in the sense that uh, tenants 
cannot go back to the unit and get into the unit, but they can have witnesses, they can make a log, uh, they can keep an eye on the internet, see if the landlord is re-advertising the place and grab that information. And as I said before, don't jump the gun, okay? You got to wait for at least five months. In good faith, waiting for the landlord to occupy the unit. So I would say, keep an eye on the internet, Grab information if you see, the moment you see your landlord is advertising, grab your hands on that, take a photo, get a, get some screen shots, and that's evidence against your landlord. Um, please also help, uh, ask for help for from your um, neighbors or people who used to know you at the place and then keep an eye with them drive whenever you can, but in some cases, some tenants move to a different place that is far from where they used to live. So it's a little bit difficult, but that's the answer I have for that specific question, Dalia. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like we have another one about tenant insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, it says tenant agrees to carry sufficient insurance. So does that mean I must purchase insurance? Okay. Uh, Normally, this is related to what the landlord requested in the contract. If the contract says that you must carry insurance, you go and get insurance. It's very simple. And so in our agreement, it says tenants agree to carry sufficient insurance. So you must purchase insurance because your contract demands it. Um, and, uh, I have another question about, um, short-term rentals. So, mm -hmm. um, let's say, uh, suite is advertised for three months and okay. at that point, um, you know, uh, the, the landlord will be kind of kicking you out at that point. Um, what recourse does somebody have in that kind of situation? It's hard, right? Because there is a housing crisis. And whatever the contract says goes. Remember that I was mentioning in the part of the contract that there was letter E that would say that you have to vacate. You cannot override that. But whatever your contract says, you must go with that. Now, landlords are very weasley in the sense that they would like you to stay, write a new contract, and increase your rent significantly. If that is what you, the tenant, want, then you do that. But if the contract clearly says you're there for three months and no more than that, and there is a vacate clause, then you should comply. Okay, so even if it's contracting out of the agreement, so these these are people that I'm helping that, you know, the, the landlords have not followed the standard tenancy agreement. They've created okay. their own private agreements that are contracting okay. out of the law. That still stands up. I, I no, no. If they contract out, yeah. then we always tell tenant to, um, to challenge, to go to the residential tenancy branch and show that the landlord is contracting out of the Residential Tenancy Act as per Section 5, landlords are not supposed to contract out of the Act, nor tenants. And so if the tenant is being a whistle in that case, then challenge. That's the only thing that can help. Right. So so it, it, it is illegal for them to say, you know, you can only live here for... That's right. I mean, normally it is related to the contract, Dalia. So yeah. if they say you can only live here three months and then later on they want to offer a new contract, then yes, it's contracting out because you, the landlord, said that only three months, but now you want to offer me a new contract and I don't think that that's fair. You can challenge. Right. And when would it fall into a short-term rental that wouldn't be under the tenancy agreement? No, under uh, short-term rentals is Airbnb, hotels, and touristical places. So you probably won't get away with it as right. a tenant. So you so might not want be able. You might not be able to stay put there uh, because your contract was a short-term rental. Tofino, for example, is one example. Um, another example is 
Prince George. You know, touristic places where they clearly say it's a short-term rental. It's very hard because there's a housing crisis and then people may want to extend because of work reasons. And yet uh, the landlord can enforce the contract. But if the landlord wants to enforce under a pretense, that's when you challenge. Okay. So we have a um, question about maintenance. Um, uh, cleaning in an apartment building, what is the rule on that? There's very little vacuuming going on hallways, five floors in this building. I will immediately turn to policy guideline number one that clearly clarifies the obligations of landlords in a building and multi-complexes. Um, it's always good to check that specific thing. Let me see if I can bring it up for you to see. Um, see. Okay. <clears throat> so in page eight, it talks about that. So uh, let me see. Here, property maintenance. Can everybody see it? Okay, it, it should be here. And so it says, the landlord is generally responsible for major projects such as tree cutting, pruning, pruning, and insect control. The landlord is responsible for cutting grass, shoveling snow, and weeding flower gardens of multi-unit residential complexes. And as for time frames, uh, what is the rule on that? There is very little vacuuming going on hallways, five floors in this uh, building. Too small. I will look that up here later. Okay. But yes, this I find very useful for renters mostly. Security, property maintenance, and there are some other isolated topics. But another good policy guideline would be policy guideline number 40 that talks about the useful life of building element. But generally, I use policy guideline number one for you to uh, inquire farther on carpets, how often they have to change them, periodic cleaning of carpets for tenants. And there are not rules that we know of on buildings maintenance. Um, that normally pertains to property agencies, and you might want to uh, bring that to the attention of the main office or head office. Inquire farther. Yeah, um, I'll just ask one more question about... Um rentals that so it's very common here on the island I deal with lots of folks that um are told that they need to vacate their suite um during the summer months because the landlord wants to rent it out as a vacation home mm -hmm. um and um uh I have uh referred them to dispute resolution but a lot of like I, I don't know if there's anything Okay, um, no, normally, yeah, normally we always tell tenants that if the contract clearly says that you have to vacate for summer month, there's nothing they can do right? because it is stated in the contract. So um, what I would suggest for them to do is to speak to a lawyer at Access Pro Bono and Access Pro Bono should be able to give them an interpretation of the contract. And it would be better for them because then tenants won't be under a lot of stress that they have to vacate. But normally it's very simple. If the contract clearly says that you have to vacate for summer month and then be back, it's done. It's clearly stated in the right. contract and there's nothing the tenants can do. Right. But vacate and comply. Right, but if there was nothing in the contract, they can uh, get away with it. Yeah. They can get away. And so then they can say, for example, um, the contract does not say anything and it was a verbal thing. So 
you're right, Dalia, they will need to arbitrate. And they will need to bring that to the attention of, a, of a, an arbitrator and bring forth any evidence. So where in the contract it says that I have to vacate. If it doesn't, then very likely the arbitrator will analyze that, that deeply and ask questions to lead to an answer for both. Great, okay, great. Great, any more questions? Great. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Emma. This has been highly informative. Yeah, and, and we are going to have two more sessions. Yes. If you wanna join us and after looking at the content, you decide, well, you know, I would like to ask more questions. I'd be glad to answer your questions. Wonderful, great. All right, thank, thank you so much everyone for attending. I'm gonna uh, wrap things up here and I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you kindly for having us. Thank you folks for coming tonight and asking your questions and participating.